In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We like labeling things, and people, and days like today. And because of the very first thing that Jesus said in our gospel reading, uh, today has become known as Good Shepherd Sunday. And most of you probably already know, or at least wouldn't be surprised to learn, that the image of Jesus as a shepherd and especially as our shepherd, is one of the most beloved images in the Christian faith. It's so popular, in fact, that people have even begun, take, or have, have, have begun taking to describing their pastors and their priests, their clergy, as their shepherds. Now, and, and speaking for myself only, well, being compared to Jesus is certainly flattering. It's the second thing that Jesus says in our gospel reading that makes this association so problematic. And what is the second thing that Jesus says in our gospel reading? Right after he says, I am the good shepherd, Jesus then says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, I don't want to sound unduly harsh or uncaring, but with the obvious exception of my immediate family, I'm not laying down my life for anyone else. So, you know, there's that. But having said that, we must nevertheless understand that labels play an important role not only in the life of the wider church, but also for individual Christians because they help us relate to God. Labels like Good Shepherd help to make God seem more understandable, more approachable. However, the labels we use to describe God are, are like a a good suit of clothes, that is, one size, does not fit all. And the following story, I think, really illustrates that point. A long time ago, in a small valley community far, far away, there was a monastery led by a wise abbot. One afternoon, a young monk came to the abbot and asked him, why is it that some men come to our community, stay a while, do all the things we do, but then leave? And yet others will come to our community, do all the things that we do, and then stay for the rest of their lives? In other words, why do some men stay and others leave? And after thinking for a few moments, the abbot responded to the young monk's question by telling him this story. He said, not too long ago, I was sitting outside and enjoying the afternoon sun. And as is often the case, my dog was curled up at my feet. As the two of us sat there in silence, a rabbit suddenly appeared out of nowhere and just as quickly scurried off. But not before my dog saw it, and took up the chase. Pretty soon my dog was out of sight and all I could hear was the sound of my dog barking. Not long after, other dogs in the, in the area hearing my dog's barking also took up the chase. And it wasn't long before our valley was filled with the sound of many dogs barking. Eventually, and after a while, all of the dogs returned to their homes. That is, except for my dog. My dog did not return. Now, clearly the abbot was finished talking, but the novice was not really satisfied. 
I asked you an important question, and, and in response, you tell me a, a silly story. So the abbot said to the novice, after hearing my story, you should have asked me, why did all of the other dogs go back to their homes and only your dog stay away? The novice was not happy with, with the way this conversation was trending, but still he wanted an answer to his question. So, all right, Ab Abbot, the novice said, please tell me, why did all of the other dogs come back and only your dog stay away? And the abbot smiled and answered him, well, the answer is quite simple. Only my dog actually saw the rabbit. And the moral of that abbot's story is this. Too often in our spiritual journeys, uh, we chase the sound of the other dog's bark and not the rabbit itself. In other words, the labels we sometimes use to describe God, to understand God, to relate to God, while helpful to some, may not be helpful to others. I'll give you some examples. For centuries, theologians have found various ways to label God, and they came up with labels like God is omnipotent, you know, all-powerful. God is omnipresent, he is everywhere. He is omniscient, all-knowing. And they're good labels, but they tend to stimulate the intellect rather than the heartstrings. I mean, they're fine if all you want is to know more about God, but it's hard to base a, a personal relationship on labels like those. An, another label for God that, that some of you might have seen on, on bumper stickers is, is God is my co-pilot. It's a better label, I think, but if you're not a pilot, it may lose something in translation. Um, if we had read our psalm this morning, it was Psalm 23. Uh, describes God as our shepherd. Not a bad image, but... but uh, but since most of us have seen pictures of shepherds and sheep, but not being shepherds and not being around sheep, even that image uh, can still leave us needing more. In various places in the gospel, Jesus describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life, as the door, as the gate, all good images, especially if you're a first century Palestinian Jew, but not very inviting, at least for me, on a personal level. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus described God as our Father, our, in Aramaic, our Abba, literally, our Daddy. Now, that's a pretty good image, because everyone has a father, and a lot of us are fathers. But for some people, it can still be chasing after another dog's bark, because if you came from a family where the father was absent or uh, unloving or abusive, then the image of God as a father is, is not a good one. But in the Middle Ages, an interesting thing happened. Some Christians began experimenting with an entirely new, well, for Christians at least, an entirely new label for God. St. Anselm, who was Archbishop of Canterbury in the 11th century, wrote these words. Jesus, as a mother, we gather your people to you. You are gentle with us as a mother is with her children. And then Julian of Norwich, a 14th century nun and mystic, wrote this. Jesus is our true mother, the protector of the love which knows no end. All of the love of offering and sacrifice of beloved and of beloved motherhood are in Christ, our beloved. And even though Anselm and Julian belong to a time very different from our own, they still managed to create a surprisingly modern-sounding uh, description of God in Christ. And I really wonder sometimes what 
Anselm's mother and what Julian's mother were like. I mean, they must have been remarkable women uh, because uh, years later their children would come to the conclusion that the, that the God they knew personally and worshipped and loved was very much like their mother's. I guess ultimately my, my, my point is that when we're trying to relate to God, we need to find a label, an image, a metaphor that works best for us. We need to keep in mind also that every image or label for God that we can think of may have both positive and negative aspects. And in our search for a label that helps us enter into a relationship with God, we have to search, we have to try each one on for size and see which fits us best. Now, two final thoughts come to mind. The first is a reminder that the labels we attach to God, the images we use, the metaphors we employ, uh, not only help us to understand God and help us to relate to God in ways that are life-giving, but they also help us to understand how we are to relate to each other. That is, and, and, and this is important, the way we understand how God relates to us is usually the way we are supposed to relate to each other. In other words, whatever it is that you expect from God, whatever it is that you look for from God is usually going to be the very same thing that you in turn need to be offering to the people around you. That's the first thought. The second thought is more of a, of a, of a word of caution. The labels we use to describe God, God as I said, are uh, like a good suit of clothes. One size does not fit all. The fact that the label for God that works for me may not be the label that works for someone else, nor is my label the best label or the only one. In fact, if you find yourself in a community of faith where everyone is forced to adopt the exact same label for God, my, my advice to you is this, don't drink the Kool-Aid. At the very least, in such a community, what you will likely find are people who are chasing the sound of another dog's barking. In the end, we, yes, we like to label things and people and days and, and even God. And on this day, which has become known as Good Shepherd Sunday, we are reminded that the image of God as our father or as our mother or as our shepherd or co-pilot are, are, are useful in helping us to understand that God is someone with whom we can enter into a personal relationship. These images are good in that they make God seem more approachable, more relatable, less threatening. But we also need to remember the story of the Abbot and his dog. And looking for labels to describe God, we need to make sure that we're actually chasing after the rabbit itself and not simply chasing after the song, the sound of another dog's barking. Let us pray. Lord God, grant us grace to desire you with our whole heart, so that in desiring you, we may seek you and find you. So that finding you, we may be for others that which you've been for us. All this we ask for the sake of your Son, our Savior, friend, shepherd, and brother, Jesus Christ. Amen.